Uh, I'm going to read just the first nine verses of 2 Peter chapter 3. Beloved, now I write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before of the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And this is the word of God. Well, the title of the message is The Enemies Among Us. So I thought what I should do, is, and, and so I did, I just took uh, names and pictures uh, of the enemies in our church, and I posted them on the other side of the Welcome Center, and you can see them there. No, I didn't do that. I thought about putting up the pictures of the deacons and trustees, but then I thought that's, that's inappropriate. Would be funny, but, but I know then the next week my picture would be up there, so I didn't do that either. But there is a very serious crisis in the church today. In fact, it started in the first century, and it's been in churches ever since. And that's what Peter addresses here. In the first century, a crisis was brewing in certain churches. And it's the same crisis that's occurring in some churches today. That is, the churches and Christians are listening to the wrong people. And so what Peter identifies these people as are scoffers. Jude 18 calls them mockers. Scoffers have been in every generation. Back in chapter 2, Peter writes, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Well, what is the reality is that the scoffers of the first century are easily recognizable today. And we'll talk a little bit about how we identify these scoffers. Their voices are constantly around us. This is especially true because of the internet and social media, but it's always been true. And the scoffers have pretty much taken over the universities. And so the scoffers are definitely with us. They are the dominant voice in our culture. Now, first of all, I want you to understand that Peter, Peter is writing to true Christians, not nominal Christians. When I say nominal, I mean in name only. I call myself a Christian, but there's nothing in my life that shows I'm following Jesus. Peter's not writing uh, to those people. He's writing to real believers. Verse 1, beloved... I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So he calls them beloved. In verse 8, he calls them beloved. This is a form of the word from agape, which is a term of Christian endearment. Agape is that spiritual love, uh, that special love. And so this is that special love that believers have for one another. Now, Pastor Brian talked a little bit about that in his uh, pre preparation for the communion service, that we come together as the body of Christ and we are connected by love with each other. And so five times he mentions beloved as he closes this particular chapter. He says they have pure minds. The word means tested as genuine. So in light of this lingering threat, Peter wants these true believers to bring certain things to the forefront of their minds. He wants to stir up their remembrance of these things. And so he talks about 
a couple things they need to do. So the same things we need to do. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets. So Peter would say, uh, look at the Old Testament. Consider the Old Testament scriptures. You see, one of the things with the scoffers is they don't want the God of the Bible. They don't want a God of justice because a God of justice is going to be a God of judgment. And they don't want judgment. So they'd rather do away with the God of the Bible. And so the Old Testament has much to say concerning the final judgment that is coming. Back in chapter 1, verse 20, so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The word dark literally means a murky. And all you have to do is look around a little bit, and you know that we're, our culture is increasingly becoming murky and polluted and actually toxic. So what do we have? Well, we have the word of the living God, Old and New Testament. It illuminates our path in this murky culture. Psalm 119 on 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. So it's the Bible that gives us the pathway through this murky culture that, that teaches us how to live for Christ in the midst of the scoffers. Then he says, look at the scriptures of the New Testament, verse 2, of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So the doctrine of the apostles formed the foundation of the church. It's the, it's the doctrine of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, that lays the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2.20. And the prophets there are New Testament prophets. So you have prophets in the Old Testament, which we look to as the inspired word of God. We have prophets and apostles in the New Testament, plus the word of Christ himself. And this is our path. This is our guide. So it should not be, surprise us that the scoffers, energized by Satan, will always attack the inerrancy and infallibility of the scriptures. The fact that the Bible is inspired God breed, they scoff at that, they reject that. In the late 60s and, and the early 80s, I well remember this, there was battles going on, they became visible at the Fuller Theological Seminary, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod and in the Southern Baptist Convention, to name a few places. In 1976, a man by the name of Howard, Harold Linzel wrote the book, The Battle for the Bible, and it became widely read. I have a copy of it down in my study. It was the needed book at the time. In fact, in many ways, the Southern Baptist Convention purged their seminaries of, of professors who no longer held to the inerrancy of scripture. But it is a battle that continues in every generation. Uh, Al Mohler writes, the Bible is the norming norm that cannot be normed. Christians must affirm biblical authority and the inerrancy of scripture, always remembering that when we surrender authority, we surrender the very existence of our churches. If we don't have an infallible and errant Bible, then everything is up for grabs. Everything is up for grabs. If we don't have an infallible source, an infallible authority, then we are left adrift on the murky seas of this murky culture, just like those who scoff at the Bible. If this book is not God-breathed, it's therefore not inerrant. We have no anchor. We have no compass. We have no shoreline. We are just tossed about by every wind of doctrine, as the Bible teaches. But we know the Word of God is indeed inspired. Now, Peter identifies the scoffers, and he, does it, he gives us three identifying marks of these scoffers. He says, verse 3, knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days. Number one, the scoffers will be identified by what they follow, by what they follow. Verse 3, walking according to their own Lust. Now, the word there means strong desire, and it can be good or bad, depending on the context. It's very obvious that this is a negative context. 
the scoffers are walking according to their own fallen desires. The last days is the period between the two advents of Jesus Christ, but there will be the last of the last days. We don't know exactly when that's coming. But we can expect the scoffers to increase as the age goes on. And so Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So these people who scoff at the Bible, who scoff at Christianity, who scoff at a faith in Christ, who, who scoff at the prophecies in Scripture, these are people who are speaking out of the abundance of their heart. So the question I want to ask you, and I want to particularly ask our young people, is who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the Word, or are you going to listen to the world? Are you going to listen to the culture, or are you going to listen to the Word of the living God? You see, scoffers declare that human experience and human wisdom is the way to understand life. Don't listen to the Bible, they say. Listen to the world. Where do you find ultimate truth? Well, they would say within themselves. They would say within the world, within culture. Look at the various religions of the world. Look at the philosophies of the world. And as you make your way through that, you'll find the keys to life. In the same way, the scoffers deny the existence of ultimate truth. There is no truth. Well, what do you have to ask? Is that statement true? I mean, if you're telling me there's no such thing as ultimate truth, you've made an ultimate truth statement. So how can I believe what you said? Because you're making a statement of ultimate truth, but at the same time denying truth which shows us how foolish the scoffers can be. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So we have to make a choice. Am I going to listen to the voice of the scoffers, or am I going to listen to the voice of the Savior? And young people, as you grow up, you're going to have to make these decisions. You are right now under the influence of your parents and the faith of your parents. But one of the things about becoming an adult is you begin to make your own decisions. You begin to decide what you believe. What do I really believe? And so I challenge you this morning, who are you going to listen to? Because you're going to hear a lot of voices in this culture. And I would say test everything. Test it by the word of God. I've often told you when God, God's word speaks, God speaks. And people attack the inerrancy of the Bible. How can you believe the Bible? There's all these different translations. When we talk about inerrancy, we mean it is infallible and erred in the original autographs. We recognize that when you translate into other languages, you, have to, uh, you can't do a word-for-word -word translation. But I can hold up my New King James Bible and say, this is the infallible and errant word of God, understanding exactly what it is that I'm saying. I can trust my Bible. Secondly, the scoffers can be identified by what they're saying, by what they're saying. Verse 4, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Can you hear the hiss of Satan in that? See, that's as old as Eden. Um, think about Genesis 3.1. Satan said to Eve, has God indeed said... Really? Has God really spoken? And then if he has spoken, Genesis 3, 4, he said to Adam and Eve, you will not surely die. Because God said, if you eat of the fruit of that tree, in dying you will die. And they ate of the fruit of the tree, and eventually they did die. And so Satan comes along, and the scoffers come along. They deny the word of God. They say God doesn't always keep his promises. God doesn't always fulfill his threats. It's as old as Eden. Those of you who believe that Jesus Christ is coming back, and there's going to be this, this cataclysmic destruction of heaven and earth, and there's going to be this final judgment, you're fools. Look at the world. Divine interventions do not happen in history. That's what they say. You can't find anything in history where you can see any divine interventions. Look at the world around you. 
Now, when they say since the creation of the world, they're not thinking of biblical creation. This particular word means to fabricate. They're not referring to the story of creation. The theory of evolution is presented as scientific fact throughout our culture. It postulates the uniformity of the universe. Since the fabrication of the universe is what they're saying, there's been this uniformity. All things continue as they were. Uh, things are evolving materially. But there's no divine intervention that you can see in history. One of the best descriptions I've heard of evolution is so much speculation masquerading as concrete truth. Well, the scoffers can be identified by what they're saying, and then they can be identified by what they are ignoring, willfully ignoring. Verse 5, for this they willingly, willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So Peter's going back to the original creation. This is the first evidence of a divine intervention in human history. And so when you read Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Well, they willfully forget that. The scoffers have rejected divine revelation of creation, and they've substituted their own theory of evolution, because I don't want a God who's a God of justice and judgment. And they continue to say, even though the evidence is clearly there, that God has not intervened in history, as the scriptures say. And so this is the second example of divine intervention in human history. Peter lists creation, then he lists the flood of Noah. So am I going to listen to the theories of the scoffers, or am I going to listen to the inspired, infallible word of the living God? I must make a choice, because Jesus taught creation, Matthew 19, 4. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, you see, those scoffers who, what we would consider liberal Christians, yes, they're atheists and agnostics, and, but these are people who claim belief in God, but these are people who want to deny the anger of God. And so verse not 6, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So they scoff at the story of the worldwide flood. They want a God who is a God of love. They want to reject any notion of judgment or justice. So exclusively, they focus on the love of God. But they have a serious problem. Because if you only see it, God as a God of love, you have to deal with reality. Reality. Look around the world. What do you see? A world in chaos. A fallen world the result of the fall, which they reject, the fact of the sinfulness of man. They want to believe in the goodness of man. But then comes along hurricanes and tornadoes and natural disasters, and they want to now, their theory now is that it's climate change. And, and uh, you know, it used to be global warming, but now they change it to climate change. And so they have to have a, a human answer for these things but yet there's still pain and suffering. There, there, there's still death. How do you account for that if you only have a God of love? And when you tell people this, basically you end up turning them into agnostics. And this is why liberal churches continue to decline. Because they don't really answer the questions that people are asking. All they offer is an empty religiosity. Yet Jesus gives us real historical facts that we can get our minds around. Jesus taught that Noah was a real person. He taught the flood was a real historic event, Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Isn't it interesting? These, 
these scoffers all through the church age, and it's going to continue, they attack the, the story of the flood, not understanding that they're going to just be like the people of Noah's generation. If you deny the historicity of the flood account, you're charging Jesus with deception. It is the scoffers, though, who willfully deny God's revelation. Verse 5, they willfully forget. The Greek scholars, Vincent and Robertson, both translate this as, this escapes them of their own will. This escapes them of their own will. This is culpable ignorance. These scoffers turn a blind eye to what they don't want to see. I, I don't want to see the evidence of a worldwide flood, though it is definitely there. I don't want to see any kind of evidence for creation. Um, I, I know that, that I believe in evolution, and there, there is no God, and well, then how did it all start? How did everything come out of nothing? That doesn't even make sense. So... I remember when the Creation Museum opened, and I was reading some of the reviews from some of the critics. They were not kind. They treated them with disdain. Many uh, scoffers now, Richard Dawkins is an example of one, they're promoting the idea that teaching creationism to children is a form of child abuse. And they really believe that. And you can kind of see where that might go. I will say to you, if you are a Christian parent and you have your children in public school, that you better be carefully watching and understanding and checking out what they're being taught. I would say if you're not doing that on a consistent basis, that is parental ignorance, parental neglect, because I'll tell you what, the scoffers dominate the educational institutions, and you better know what your children are being taught. So now Peter responds to the scoffers, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now Peter's talking about the present heavens and the present earth. There is coming a future divine intervention on planet earth. Now we believe that Christ will return for his church at the rapture before the tribulation begins. And at the end of the tribulation, Christ will come back to the earth in judgment. The present world system is reserved for destruction by fire. God promised to never again destroy the world with water. But God now declares that the world will be deserved, re, re, destroyed by fire. You don't have to worry about um, a nuclear war. You don't have to worry about... Uh, Russia launching nuclear missiles and we retaliate and, and going to destroy the world. That's not going to happen. You say, why is that not going to happen? Because God has a reservation, a preservation. Look at the verse. This world is preserved by the same God who destroyed the world with water, the same God who created the universe, continues to sustain the universe, until one day it will be destroyed by fire. In the creation, God stored up the water that would be used to destroy the earth at that time. We don't know if there was a vapor canopy. We don't know how that worked. But within the creation was the means for the destruction of the world at Noah's flood. This verse tells us that God has kept fire in store to destroy the world of the future. The word preserved is where we get our word thesaurus. A thesaurus, I have a thesaurus in, in my study, it's a collection of words. It's an idea of a collection of something. We know the core of the earth is filled with fire. We know the sun is a ball of fire. We don't know for sure how God is going to do this, but we know that the destruction of the heaven and the earth will be by fire. We know it's connected to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, clearly revealed in both testaments. Malachi 4.1, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. 
and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. 2 Thessalonians 1. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he has this preserved. And then the word reserved means to guard, means to keep. God in some way and somehow has preserved, has kept in store fire to destroy the heavens and the earth. And he's watching over it. He's guarding it. And only God knows when this day will come. Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, with all this, with all this talk of destruction by fire, we learn a couple things about the character of God. Because God's apparent delay is an evidence of his character. Verse 8, but beloved, there's that word again, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The scoffers want to subject God to their own human notions of time. Now, Peter here is quoting from Psalm 90, verse 4. That's why I wanted Dwight to read that passage. A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, like a watch in the night. Think of all the history that has occurred since the year 1022, the past thousand years. How many kings, how many emperors, how many rulers, how many nations have come and gone? How many events of history in a thousand years? God says, it's one day. In my view, that's one day. God can see one day. He can see one person. He can see one church. He can see one family. No wonder Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And then Peter points out another aspect of God's character. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is giving people time for repentance. Before you were saved, what if, what if Christ returned one day before you came to know him as Savior? Where would you be? Where would I be? There are people that need the Lord that need to come to the Lord. Down in verse 15, consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Repentance involves agreeing with God that I'm a sinner, understanding that Jesus Christ is the one and only way of salvation, turning away from my self-righteousness, turning away from any religious things that I think will save me, turning to, to Christ and, and confessing the fact that I'm a sinner, and asking God to save me because of what Christ has done for me. Now, God is not here decreeing a universal salvation. This is the desire of his heart. 1 Timothy 2.4, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, then why doesn't God just go ahead and save everybody? Different theologians debate what this means. They say, well, this is, this is God's will of character. Or this is God's will of desire. Then you get into the whole election predestination argument. What this tells me is there is, a, I believe, a human element to salvation. I don't understand how election and predestination is clearly taught in the Bible, nor do I also understand the invitation passages and human responsibility passages in the Bible, I cannot square those two together. But I think a lot of times we waste our time trying to figure that out because there are lost people all around us. 
And rather than arguing about theology and all these things, we would do well to put more concern on those who are lost. I agree with Chuck Swindoll. He said, we should apply this verse to those we know who are not saved. Put their names in verse 9 instead of us and any and all. Let's lose a, use a generic name, Mary. God is long-suffering toward Mary, not willing that Mary should perish, but that Mary should come to repentance. Whose name could you put in there? What loved one, what friend do you believe is very likely not saved? And we spend a lot of our time on trivial things. Could we write that out or type that out and put it on our mirror or put it in the car or put it on our computer or <clears throat> put it somewhere where we see it every day, where we pray for that individual every day, pray for their salvation every day? Because we know what's going to happen to them if they go out into eternity without Jesus Christ. Before too long, I plan to preach a sermon on the horrors of hell and then on the one, another sermon on the wonders of heaven. I've got more information about hell in the Bible than heaven. And when you study the doctrine of hell, it is horrific. I mean horrific. So how much are we really concerned about our loved ones who don't know the Lord. And so I would challenge all of us, whether you do it this way or however, you know, how many tears have we seriously wept for someone who is unsaved? Because the day is coming. Lord willing, in two weeks we'll finish this chapter. The day of the Lord will come, Peter says. Doesn't matter how long it's been, doesn't matter what the scoffers say, this world is reserved for destruction by fire. And if people don't know the Lord, that's going to be their destiny.